Today we come to the first section, the first few verses of Malachi uh, chapter 1, and we will look at this together. If you'll follow along Malachi chapter 1, we'll go ahead and read the text, verses 2 through 5, and then I'll ask that we together ask the Lord to teach us. Malachi chapter 1, verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say... How have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. And I have made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Though Edom says, we have been beaten down, but we will return and build up the ruins. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will tear down. And men will call them the wicked territory and the people towards whom the Lord is indignant forever. Your eyes will see this and you will say, The Lord be magnified beyond the border of Israel. Let's pray. Lord, as we now come to your word, may it open our eyes. We pray that you would open our hearts. And that we might be reassured of the love that you spoke here to your people. Father, thank you for the words of Malachi. May they honor your son today as we preach them. In Jesus' name, amen. In years past, when my family would visit the toy section of the store, we would usually spend our time in either the Lego aisle, the Star Wars aisle, or the sports aisle. Now we have a daughter, (laughs) and we have to visit a new aisle. This new aisle, in, in my boy's imagination, this new aisle is a godforsaken place that they call the pink aisle. Just walking down the pink aisle will give you cooties. At least that's what they keep telling me. I learned new things on the pink aisle. I've not spent a lot of time there. I was walking down it recently and I noticed, you know, things that I was familiar with. Certain dolls, Barbie dolls and Cabbage Patch dolls. And then I discovered a new doll. One that I'd I'd never heard, I'd never seen before. And it wasn't so much that the doll caught my attention as much as the name of the doll caught my attention. I was sitting there looking at it, and it's you know, the plastic cartoonish sort of figure of a, of a little girl, and she's wearing fashionable clothes and, and has trendy accessories. And the name of the, the line of dolls were, was Bratz. And to make matters worse, they spelled Bratz with a Z, B-R-A-T-Z. Who does that? Like, don't misspell words. (laughs) I stood there on the pink aisle looking at that, and it it sort of, for a moment, it it made me sad. Because it's at least troubling, I think, that, that a toy manufacturer would promote being a brat, as if that were some kind of virtue. As if that were a good thing for little girls to look up to, to being a brat. Now, we we see people from time to time, oh boy, he's a spoiled brat, or he's acting like a brat. The way that we often do this is we look at what they do and sometimes what they don't do. Usually a person who is a brat or acting like one they're a person who does not, or excuse me, they're a person who wants more stuff than they have, and they're rarely appreciative of the stuff they already have. They want more stuff, and they don't even, they're not even grateful for what they do have. You remember in Willy Wonka, the girl that turned into a blueberry, you know? That's a perfect picture of a brat. I want it now, she said. And there are some people in our world that that's sort of how they live. 
that they're simultaneously discontent and ungrateful. Brats are, are quick to say gimme, but slow to say thank you. Now, as we open the book of Malachi, that idea is actually a fairly good description of how the nation of Israel is acting. They're acting like brats. On the one hand, as they look at, at, at in this passage at God's love, they're, they're discontent. They want God to do more. And yet at the same time, they, they're not even appreciative or grateful for what God has already done for them. And so in these opening verses, the prophet Malachi comes, and what you find here is he has to confront the nation of Israel for their half-hearted appreciation of God's love. A half-hearted appreciation for God's love. Israel was saying, we, we, need, we don't think God loves us. God needs to prove it to us. He hasn't done enough. And he's saying, we, they're saying, we, we, need God, we need more of God's love. And Malachi says, no, 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 no. You don't need more of God's love. You need more appreciation for God's love. Because whether you feel like it or not, whether your emotions tell you that or not, the fact of the matter is, Israel, God loves you. And don't you doubt it. Don't you argue with it. Don't you for one moment think that is not the case. The fact of the matter is, God loves you. And he tells Israel... You need to stop saying gimme and start saying thank you. Start saying thank you. Start appreciating appreciating the love of God that has been shown to you. By the way, I wonder about us sometimes. Don't we act like this ourselves? Gimme, 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 gimme. And sometimes the thank yous are, are slow or they're disingenuous. And we can get to a point as if God owes us something. Well, I'm a, I'm a good person. I, I, I do the things I should. As if God is, is, is indebted to us. And Malachi comes and he confronts Israel's misunderstanding and assures them that God does indeed love them. Notice how this section begins in verse 2. I have loved you says the Lord. I have loved you. That little word have makes a huge difference in this sentence. For God, If God had just said, I loved you, that may have been true of something just in the past that God did, but not necessarily the present. But for God to say, I have loved you, it implies something that started in the past, Deuteronomy chapter 7, all the way at the beginning of Israel, God says, why did I pick Israel? Because you're the smartest, because you're the biggest. Nope, nope, nope. I picked you because I love you. That was it. And so he's reaffirming that by saying, not just I loved you, but I, I have loved you and I still do. Even though you're complaining about your temple and even though you, you, you think that Israel, or Jerusalem's too small and abandoned, you're not the world power you used to be. Even though your circumstances may not seem like what they used to be, rest assured, I still love you. God declares to them His enduring love. Then notice what happens next. But you say... Now just stop there for a second. We're going to see this in the weeks ahead, so I want to point it out now. The entire book of Malachi is arranged like a conversation really kind of a debate and dialogue between the Lord and Israel. The Lord says something, then Israel says something. Then the Lord says something in response to that, then Israel says something in response to that. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. Now, it doesn't seem like it was an actual dialogue, but but that Malachi the prophet is using this format to, to, to show the general attitude of the people. What I love about this is that Malachi, if you notice, he is the voice of God and the voice of Israel. He's like a prophetic ventriloquist, you might say, you know. There's God over here who says something, and then he's like, yeah, what do you mean? 
You know, like he, he goes back and forth on the Lord's behalf saying this, and then he, he speaks for this is how the people are acting. So God says, he declared, I have loved you. Then notice, but you say, in contrast to this, you say, how have you loved us? That's where they're acting like a brat. That's where they're being cynical, sarcastic. God declares, I have loved you and I I still love you. And they say, oh, really? Are you sure that you love us? Because as I look around, it doesn't look like you love us. Look at our, 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 our temple. Look at our city. Look at our lack of power. It doesn't seem, God, like you love us. By the way, do you ever let your emotions drive your theology like that? Don't put your emotions in the driver's seat. Don't start with how you feel. Or start even with your circumstances. They say, but but how have you loved us? Come on, God, it doesn't seem like you really do care for us. What's really interesting in this, it's been said before, the saddest thing in all the world is unrequited love. You know what that is? It's love that's unreturned. Boy meets girl, boy loves girl, girl could care less. You know, just walks off. That's sad, right? It's 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 heartbreaking. And here in this passage here, the, we find that, that, that God is the, the, the spurned lover. God's the one saying, I love you. And, and Israel is like, turned her back and, and folded her arms and like, I don't really think so. What do you mean that you love us? Prove it. I don't think so. I mean, look at everything. How have you loved us? And they have this lack of appreciation, like a spoiled brat, as if God hasn't really loved them. So they ask, how have you loved us? And now God is going to answer their question and He's going to prove His love to them. He's going to show them His enduring love and there's two pieces of evidence that He points to. Number one, He tells them that, the, that God's people should consider their history. T- to better appreciate God's love, He tells Israel, you need to consider your history. So maybe the present doesn't seem like God's love you, but now he says, let me, let me go to the past. Let's go back a few years and let me show this to you. They say, how have you loved us? So then God replies, was not Esau Jacob's brother? He answers their question with a question. Was not Esau Jacob's brother? God says, I'll prove my love to you. You don't think I love you. Let me prove it to you and let me give you a little history lesson. Let's go back in the family trees. Let's go back and look. Let me, let me show this to you. Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Now, most of you may know this, but in case you don't, we'll, we'll quickly look at this. Jacob and Esau were twin sons of Rebekah and Isaac. Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac begat both Jacob and Esau. Esau, his descendants became known as Edom. That's important to the story, so hang on to that. Esau, Edom. Jacob had his name changed to Israel, and his descendants became known as, you guessed it, Israel. So uh, Esau, Edom, Jacob, Israel, Israel. So he, he, he starts to prove his point. I have loved you, and the way that I've proved this is by this question. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? The point of the question is this. Listen, the, these two men, these two brothers... They had the same parents, they had the same lineage, basically the same blood work, they they shared the same womb, and so you would assume that they could also make the same claim to God's favor and that they would have the same relationship with God, but guess what? They didn't. There was something different between Israel and Edom and their relationship with God. And so God takes them back and says, wait a minute, if if, if you don't think I love you, you don't think I care for you, look at the twin brother here who who would arguably have the same circumstances and the same relationship, but doesn't. Notice his reply, was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord, yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. I have loved Jacob, he says but I've hated Esau. 
Now, I know that this language here, the love-hate lingo, makes us a little bit uncomfortable, doesn't it? Some of you, your stomach feels weird right now, right? Because of what we're about to, to look at. What do you mean God loves Jacob but hated Esau? This is difficult for us to stand, understand, and much of this deserves to be wrestled with. It, it, it's a really interesting way to answer this question. God says, you, you remember the four spiritual laws? God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Malachi's message is God loves you and has a not-so-wonderful plan for Edom. Like, that's, that's how he proves it. He says, I've loved, I've loved Jacob, but I've hated Esau. Now, when, when we think of this idea of love and hate, what causes us problems is that we generally think in, in, in purely terms of emotion, affection. That we have this sliding scale of love and hate, and that there's sort of like and dislike, but it's not quite hate, and we have these, this sort of understanding. The way scripture writers often use, though, the concepts of love and hate was not uh, in terms of emotions and affections. It was one of... Um, what we would say are alliances or even priorities. So you come into the New Testament, it's what Jesus said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, he cannot be my disciple. Is he telling you it's spiritual to tell your mom I hate you? No. His point is it's a matter of priorities that you have a special relationship with Jesus that even trumps your relationship with your mother or father. And he says you are to give that relationship priority. And so by saying, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated, he's showing his alliance here that God has a, a special relationship with Jacob and with Israel that he does not have with any other nation. And the whole Old Testament bears that out, right? Israel was God's people that received the word of God. They're the ones who wrote this. They're the ones through which God worked in sending Christ. So God worked in a way through Israel that he hasn't worked through any other nation. And he's making that point to them. Esau and Jacob, you'd think they'd be equal. You'd think they'd have the same relationship, but they don't. I have loved Jacob and I have hated Esau. Now, if you go back to the question at hand, God's proving his love to them. If we were grading on a curve here, most of us would probably, just comparing the two guys, we would have given priority to Esau. He was the firstborn. He was the one that that, that would ordinarily, if anybody got favorites, it would have been him. But it's not. God loved Jacob. Now, I, I, sometimes we get to this and, and, and the... The, the problem, the difficulty, we say, but yeah, I understand, but how could God hate Esau? That's not the question. The real question is, how could God love Jacob? If Jacob and Esau deserved anything, like any of us, it was God's rejection. But he says here, the the way I'm proving my love is that even though I've rejected Esau, I have placed my special relationship with with Jacob and with his descendants. If I could say it this way, in in terms of this, the, the, the hatred of God is deserved by everyone. The love of God is deserved by no one. And the moment at which we get to the point that we think God owes us something and, and we deserve God's love, we've misunderstood who we are. He says here, neither one of them deserve it. They were both scoundrels, by the way. But God said, I have a special relationship with Jacob and with Israel. And this, he says, is is the point to prove my love for you. Notice what he says in verse 3. But I have hated Esau, and the evidence of this, I have made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. So he, he, he points here, to the rejection of Esau and what's happened to them historically. And, and he uses that as evidence to say, look, now I've loved you, Israel. Now think about this. What has Israel been bellyaching about and complaining about? Oh, our temple's too small. Our, Jerusalem's not that populated. We're still under the thumb of the Persians. 
life is not that good and, 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 and the, 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 our na- our, we're not filled with glory like we thought we would be and, and things are just so bad. And God's reply is, you think things are bad? You could be Edom. Things could be a lot worse. He, he compares them by saying, oh, you think your temple's lousy? Well, guess what? You could be Edom who has no temple. You don't think I love you? Look, you're, you're back in Jerusalem. You could, like Edom, live in the wilderness. Oh, you, you, you don't think that I love you? He, he says there, well, we don't have, you don't think that you have many neighbors of Jerusalem? Other Jews? Guess what? Your neighbors could be like Edom. They could be coyotes in the wilderness. He says that is evidence, that proves, that shows my love for you. By the way, isn't it tempting for us to do this? We compare oftentimes, when we're thinking about, does God love me, does God care for me, and we walk around, we compare what we have with what we want to have. And we draw our conclusions on the basis of that comparison. We say, well, I'm single, and I want to be married, so I guess God doesn't love me if I'm not married. I drive this old car, and I want a new car, and I don't have that, so God must not love me. Malachi's point is, don't compare what you have with what you want. Compare what you have with what you deserve. And what do we deserve? We deserve, because of our sin and because of our rebellion, for the smoke of our torment to go up day and night forever and ever without end. God didn't love Jacob because Jacob was respectful or because Jacob was skillful or because Jacob was beautiful. He loved God. He loved him because God is merciful. And the mercy of God is made known that he would come and that he would establish this special relationship with him. And so God points them back. He says, you don't think that I love you? Go back and look at Jacob and Esau. Go look at history. Look at what I've done in the past. And you'll see. It's Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God and not of works, lest any man should boast. Malachi tells Israel, listen, guys, understand, it is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Jacob I have loved. So he tells them, stop acting like brats and recognize. Okay, you may not feel it in the present. Go back and look at the past. How many of us, we get in those valleys and those difficult times, and I'm not sure God loves me, and we grow, fill ourselves with doubt and difficulty. And he says, no, 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 instead of just looking at where you are in the present, go back and look at what God has done for you in the past. Go look at at how He saved you and look how He's discipled you and how He's grown you when He's answered your prayers. Look at what He's done in the past and let that stand as a monument to God's love. He tells them to consider their history. The second evidence, God's people tells them, or God tells them that they should consider their destiny. Not only should they consider their history, He then tells them that they should consider their destiny. Verse 4. Though Edom says, we have been beaten down, but we will return and build up the ruins. So now the prophet Malachi, he changes from the past. He says, look at what God did in the past, Jacob and Esau. Now he turns his attention from the past to the future. And he begins to say, now look at what's going to happen in the years ahead. If you're doubting God's love, look at his promises to Edom and his promises to Israel and look what he's going to do and tell me that doesn't prove God's love. Though Edom says we have been beaten down, we will return and build up the ruins. This is not just sort of nationalistic optimism that, well, as a nation we were demolished, but we'll we'll, we'll rebuild. If you remember from the book of Obadiah, Edom was a nation eaten up with pride and arrogance. Their, Their motto was not in God we trust, it was in Edom we trust. 
And so they said, well, we're going to do this despite what God says. We don't care what God says. We're going to make ourselves a great nation. We're going to be a great people. And so he says in verse 4, Thus says the Lord of hosts, They may build, but I will tear down. And men will call them the wicked territory and the people towards whom the Lord is indignant forever. He says here, yes, Edom might think they're going to rebuild, but God is going to demolish what they rebuild. My friends, God is sovereign over all things, and those who oppose Him are doomed. Edom opposes God. And as such, he says they'll be called the wicked territory. By the way, the issue here, let's look at verse 5. Verse 5, he says, Your eyes will see this, will see the destruction of Edom, and you will say... The Lord be magnified beyond the border of Israel. It's really interesting there. The difference here, he says, the proof of, of my love for you, it is found, that the difference is not found in the circumstances or in your feelings. The difference is found in the promise of hope. He says, Edom, it doesn't matter how many times they rebuild, God's going to tear it down. Edom has no hope. They have nothing to look forward to because as in their wickedness and in their pride and their, igno- ig- uh, their arrogance, whatever they build, like an anthill, God's just going to tear it back down. And he says here, they're going to become the wicked territory. But you, on the other hand, guess what? You will be on the sidelines seeing this, which means what? That Israel, while Edom is being destroyed, Israel will be preserved. It's an issue of a future hope. God says, I made a promise with you and I'm going to keep it and you will be alive unto that day. He says, the Lord will be magnified beyond the borders of Israel. By the way, there's a great play on words between verse 4 and 5. It says that, that Edom will, they will call them the wicked territory or the wicked place. And then verse 5, it says, the Lord be magnified beyond the the territory or the place of Israel. The play on words is something like this, that Edom will forever be known as the unholy land and Israel will be called the holy land, the glorious place. I, I don't know about you, last time I checked, people didn't you know, get together in tour buses and go look at the land of Edom. People go do that today? No. No. Is Edom represented at the the United Nations? No. Because God's promises here came true and they were ruined. But guess who is still around? Israel. And just as he said that the Lord would keep his promise, that they, he says, will then see this and will say, may the Lord be magnified beyond the borders of Israel. So he says, don't just look at your history, what I've done in the past, but look at your destiny. Edom will be destroyed, but you will not. You will be there preserved. You will be there as a nation just as I have promised to work through you. I will do it, and you will say, wow, the Lord be magnified. God is not just a tribal deity of just a few people. He is the sovereign Lord of the universe, and every nation is accountable to him. And he says here, you will see this and you will say, may the Lord be magnified, glorified, not just in Israel, not in our little piece of real estate and land, but may the whole earth know his glory because he is the sovereign, true God. Malachi tells them, stop acting like brats. The Lord loves you. I know your circumstances right now may not look like it. And sometimes we get there and sometimes we feel that way. But he says, go look at the past and what God has done and look at the promise of the future, what God has done. And you will say, may the Lord be magnified and glorified. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time in your word and the prophet Malachi. And Lord, now as we turn our attention to this table, this place of communion, this place of remembering what Christ has done, we ask, Lord, that our hearts would be knit together. May we have a renewed sense of appreciation 
May we have a renewed sense of worship and gratitude for the body and the blood of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your love. And thank you for this reminder of it. In Jesus' name, amen.